In modern astronomy, it's quite common to try to discuss differences between various stars in order to find out what sort of planets those stars can form and if any of those stars can actually have Earth-like planets. But we don't always go beyond our galaxy, and we very rarely focus on galactic differences. So in this video, instead of focusing on various interstellar or interplanetary differences, we're going to go a little bit bigger. We're going to focus on galaxies. And specifically, we're going to focus on galactic differences when it comes to the effects from the supermassive black hole in the middle. Because as we know today, quite a lot of galaxies, or basically almost all galaxies so far, seem to have supermassive black holes in the center. There are obviously some exceptions, such as the Triangulum Galaxy, you can learn more about this in the description, but for the most part, the majority of galaxies out there have these central giants right in the middle. And quite a few of these black holes are much more massive than the one in the middle of the Milky Way and actually produce very unusual effects that doesn't happen inside our own galaxy. Ways that can potentially create completely different planets and completely different stars and more importantly, dramatically increase chances for potentially habitable planets. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton. Today we're going to discuss some of the recent discoveries when it comes to what's known as AGN or Active Galactic Nucleus Focusing on recent discoveries from just the last few months on how a lot of different active galactic nuclei dramatically change galaxies, making them very different from the Milky Way. But to start, well, let's basically define what exactly we're discussing. Here is an example of the most famous AGN out there, 3C273, a very bright quasar that despite appearing as a star is of course a black hole in the middle of a distant galaxy. And when some of these black holes become very massive and acquire very large accretion disks, they start to produce so many different emissions that they basically become visible from billions of light years away. And although we know of different types of AGNs or active galactic nuclei, for the most part it's believed to be just a matter of perspective. Depending on the point of view, it just appears a little bit different and emits different types of electromagnetic spectrum. But because these are so bright and so persistent, potentially lasting for hundreds of millions or even billions of years, naturally this phenomenon today represents one of the most fascinating fields in astronomy. Though most studies today focus on quasars or blazers, once again representing a slightly different point of view. But based on modern observations we know that generally it looks like the number of AGNs is decreasing over time. In distant universe, billions of light years away, up to about 20-30% to of all galaxies used to have active galactic nuclei. But in the modern universe this number is closer to 1%. Only 1 in 100 galaxies would usually have an active galactic nucleus. Which still implies that most galaxies very likely went through this stage that most likely affected them to some extent. And so one of the first things that scientists wanted to discover in this case is of course how exactly does this affect the galaxy in terms of chemistry? Is there any effect in terms of chemical distribution inside the galaxy because of all of these emissions coming from the center? Which is exactly what some of the recent studies decided to focus on. But in this case, picking one of the closest AGNs to us, Messy 77, a beautiful spiral galaxy that's classified as a Cepher galaxy containing an active galactic nucleus in the center. A galaxy that's known for a lot of activity, including one of the major detections of neutrinos coming right from the center of the galaxy. This was one of the few sources detected and confirmed to date, which of course implies a very active central black hole. In terms of classification, C for galaxy just means the galaxy that does have an active nucleus, but also where you can actually see the rest of the galaxy, so things like the spiral arms, stars and so on. In a galaxy like a quasar, because they are so far away and so powerful, you don't really see anything except for the emissions from the accretion disk. Nevertheless, this is still a very powerful center and so it does represent an active galactic nucleus, 52 million light years away from planet Earth. But in the past, it was always very difficult to measure chemical composition inside or even outside of galaxies especially when the gas is around an active black hole. But this time the team was able to use the observations from the ALMA telescope in order to map the distribution of 23 different molecules. 
doing so with extreme precision and even mapping them along the jets coming from the black hole. In the process discovering that things like for example hydrogen cyanide, which you can see here in yellow, seems to be mostly found near the center of the black hole. A lot of other organic molecules, including cyanide radicals, you can actually see in red and they seem to be emanating away from the black hole, even along the bipolar jets. Whereas a lot of the blue color here depicts the very important molecule of carbon monoxide, which surprisingly seems to be almost completely absent from the center. What I guess one of the more important discoveries being the fact that many of these molecules seem to definitely break down and seem to follow the path of the galactic jets, with the concentration of certain molecules dramatically increasing along the black hole jets or in some cases decreasing or even disappearing depending on the molecule. Which of course highlights that not only do black holes change the structure of the galaxy, they also dramatically change the chemical composition. And because today we know that planet Earth is the way it is precisely because of unique chemical composition, and specifically various types of minerals that would be otherwise unavailable to us, there is a very high chance that some of these galaxies might have entirely different types of planets. Or maybe in some of these galaxies, terrestrial planets or planets like planet Earth might be exceptionally rare. Whereas we know that in the Milky Way they're not. Quite a lot of red dwarfs seem to contain a lot of terrestrial planets. But this is of course just one of the effects these galaxies experience. Quite a lot of them eventually acquire these enormous blobs of ionized gas, referred to as super bubbles. And in this case, this is most likely caused by the very powerful galactic wind produced by powerful emissions from the accretion disk around the black hole. And so just like our sun produces solar winds, these ridiculously powerful black hole accretion disks produce their own winds as well. But here winds are so powerful that they actually extend up to 60,000 light years across. At least that's what was recently seen around three separate quasars with these very powerful winds heating up and blowing away a lot of the cooler gas that usually results in star production. And so many of these galaxies with powerful galactic winds very likely lose the material meant to produce new stars and thus completely stop star production. But I guess what's really intriguing from these new observations is how extremely similar this seems to appear to the unusual Fermi bubbles that we have in the center of the Milky Way as well with the one main difference. Fermi bubbles seem to be quite insignificant and quite weak in comparison to these super bubbles detected around various quasars. Which of course implies one thing. Many different galaxies probably get similar bubbles when the black hole becomes active, but only some galaxies have massive enough black holes to then start dramatically transforming the galaxy and stopping star production. And it would actually even be very difficult to imagine exactly what these galaxies look like on the inside. It's quite likely that, because all of this happened billions of years ago, many of them have very primitive stars and extremely ancient planets. Nothing new and potentially nothing terrestrial or of course habitable. And even stranger, some of these outflows are so powerful that they now even have their own name. UFOs. Ultra fast outflows. Super powerful space winds emerging from these massive black holes that seem to actually blow the wind very close to the speed of light. And turns out that up to 30% of all AGNs seem to have very powerful space winds. Although in most cases the wind moves at maybe 10 to 30% of the speed of light. So fast enough to disrupt everything and powerful enough to dramatically change the shape and the composition of the galaxy. But the biggest question is of course, why not Milky Way? What exactly makes the Milky Way so different that the central black hole here does not produce similar effects and did not transform the Milky Way into anything extreme. Is this basically just another reason why we kind of got lucky and found ourselves in just the right galaxy? And if so, is all of this because of the size of the black hole? Milky Way's black hole is relatively small compared to other galaxies and so we're not entirely sure if this is maybe the main reason. Because so many galaxies out there have relatively massive black holes much more massive than the one in the Milky Way, it might imply that maybe the Milky Way is kind of rare as well. But this is not something we're going to be able to answer until future studies or until more observations from telescopes like the James Webb. At least for now we know that our galaxy used to be active, at least a little bit, but that activity pales in comparison 
to many other galaxies, including Massey 77, changing the composition of the entire galaxy right from the center all the way to the outskirts. This is not something we detect here in the Milky Way at all. And so at least for now, this is maybe just one of many mysteries to add to the mysteries of the Milky Way. And you can learn about more in the description below. On that note, we'll come back and talk more about this once there are some updates or discoveries. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support the channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying a wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.